Welcome back, and we have breaking news. We have Harley Schlanger on from the Roosh Foundation with some remarkable stories to talk about. And, of course, some breaking news with Tim Alexander. We'll be doing more discussions in Hour 3 and then after on our live stream channel and expanded report. If you don't have a live stream membership, get it now. It's the 1st of May, $12 a month or 100 for a year. Well worth it because we're going to be doing a lot of some multi-point conferences, lots of other material we'll be posting up that will be exclusively on our live stream channel. So you do want to get a membership. Uh, Tim, tell us the breaking news first, and this will tie in with what we are talking about with Harley and all the issues that are coming up because the system worldwide is unraveling and things are going to get very unstable the rest of this year. Yeah, I have a feeling May is going to be a very hot uh, month. Okay, here's what's happening. Uh, today, uh, the cassette uh, in Israel passed emergency legislation. They are calling up Army Reserves. Uh, they have authorized 22 battalions. That is a massive force uh, to be called up, and already six uh, Army battalions have been called up under emergency orders uh, to meet at what they are calling a growing threat on the Egyptian and Syrian borders. So we're talking about a multi-divisional call-up of Israeli uh, reserve forces. Now, this is normally something that's done on the eve of war, although it can also be part of a psychop operation. But uh, this is a very big thing. The Most of the Israeli news media has embargoed the story. The Times of India, though, or I'm sorry, the Times of Israel has broken the story, uh, but all the other Israeli uh, stations and so forth are not carrying it yet, which uh, is kind of a red flag in and of itself. But uh, this is a lot of Israeli boys being called from their jobs and from college uh, to put on their uniforms and to prepare to go to war. Yeah, and I think that um, from what I heard from many sources, kind of putting it, synthesizing it together, the globalists want at least temporarily the price of oil to go to 150 to 200 barrel do- dollars a barrel. The only thing that can do that is a regional war in the Middle East. Uh, assuming uh, the regional war stays regional. Yeah. And uh, if you're right, uh, that would uh, absolutely collapse the global economy. We, yeah, we that's, their, that's their game. They want to collapse yeah. it because they know that Europe is teetering. Europe is going to crash by the summer, even if there is not a regional war. Uh, the, the Spanish are trying to say they're not going to borrow money. The, all these other nations are going under, and they're asking more and more money from the European Central Bank. And the world, the, the, all these other nations, like the BRICS nations, they demanded that they give many more billions of dollars. The new treaty that they put forward last week in Europe, and I want Harley to comment on this, is pretty crazy. It talks about... Well, let me me start just with one thing on what Tim said on this breaking news, which is that it's not surprising this would happen given the terrible week that Netanyahu has had, because it's it's now no longer just one or two... Uh, senior Israeli establishment figures, like it was Mayor Dagan, the former head of the Mossad. But now you have the former head of the Shin Bet, Diskin. And then I think very importantly, uh, Ehud Olmert, who was an old colleague and sidekick of Netanyahu for years in the Likud party. Olmert was then the prime minister after Sharon. And Olmert came out at, at an Israeli-sponsored event in New York City and said that he doesn't trust Netanyahu and Barack, there's no reason to go to war. And when he was booed by the largely American Jewish audience, Omer showed some real courage because he said, I find it really interesting that people who live 10,000 miles from Israel are making comments that will lead to the deaths of people that are my family and my friends who live in Israel. You're, you're, you're and, totally right, Harvey. These guys, and by the way, there have been several other uh, uh, former retired Sinbeth and Mossad and military intelligence chiefs that have joined uh, in. But Even the uh, current uh, IDF chairman. And, yeah, uh, but the, yeah. here's the thing. These guys are as tough as nails. There's not a pacifist or a liberal among any of them. That's right. Uh, And these guys are totally dedicated not to a globalist agenda, but to their their nation state of Israel, their people and their tribe. And they see that this this insane drive to war by, I call him 666, uh, B.B. Netanyahu, and uh, his band of (laughs) lunatics in his cabinet. puts all of Israel, not just all of the Middle East, but it puts Israel, their Israel, at total risk 
and right. it is insane. I'm going to have to go right now. I'll try to be back on later. Uh, yeah, Dr. give Bell. a call if you can back in hour but, three, and we'll do a show is, after this. This is very big breaking news. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it fits into this charge that either Diskin or Olmert made that Netanyahu and Ehud Barak are messianic in their outlook. You know, the other thing about Netanyahu's bad week is his father died this last week at 102 years old. His father, Ben Zion Netanyahu, was the American secretary to Jabotinsky, who is the founder of the so-called revisionist Zionist movement. And that was the movement that claims all of the territory of the Middle East for Israel. So Bibi is a second-generation kook, and this is a grouping which... The, what Tim said about the military, not only are they hard as nails, but they're realists. And they know that they could destroy Iran, but at what price? What would happen to Israel uh, in the counterattack and in the, the hatred that would come out of doing such an act? And so we're seeing a very significant reaction in Israel against it. So it's not surprising that Netanyahu would then come out and say, well, the hell with it, we're going to build up and get ready for war. And the idea that they're preparing for possible incursions from Lebanon and Syria means that they're disappointed as well that the Syrian gambit has not worked out the way they wanted. That is that there's enough pressure against arming the so-called opposition in Syria that it hasn't fully happened yet. Yeah, exactly. Guys, I, I have to go, but God bless. Uh, very good. Yeah, Harley, let's let's dissect these various, if you want to call pressures on this disaster that's coming. And I see a, a gather storm. We have Europe. How close is Europe to collapsing even without a Middle Eastern issue? How close is Obama right. willing to do almost anything to get reelected, including even declaring a war? Because it looks like Sheriff Arpaio is closing in on him, and it's almost certain that, uh, that there's also forces within the globalists <clears throat> that aren't happy with him closing off the XL pipeline, which, appear, according to Lindsey Williams and other experts, uh, the, a lot of the powers that be are definitely ticked off at Obama. They're not happy well, let's with start, the way. Let's start with Europe, and, and we can get to Obama after the break. But with Europe, you're right about Spain. Spain is now the detonator. The Spanish oh. banks are going to need between three quarters of a trillion and a trillion dollars by the end of the year, a trillion euros, I should say, which is about 1.3 trillion, to bail out the Spanish banks. They were just downgraded by Moody's. Now, Spanish banks are not really Spanish. They're part of the inter-alpha group. Santander, which is one of the largest banks in the world, is essentially part of the Rothschilds inter-alpha group from London. BBV, which is, you see them all over the United States, the BBV is Banco de Bibao y Vizcaya. This is a Spanish bank, which is also British. Now, as well, Lloyd's and Royal Bank of Scotland were downgraded this week. Lloyd's is almost 50% owned by the British government. And then to top it off, Britain was declared in a recession because of the second straight month of, or second straight quarter of negative growth. So we're looking at a meltdown in Europe. And then, of course, you have the Sarkozy election. Uh, Sarkozy will probably lose. And Hollande is making noises largely under the influence of my friend Jacques Cheminade that he might even consider Glass-Steagall. And so the French banking system's in trouble. If the Spanish banks go, the French banks will go, and you'll have a meltdown in Europe. And you think that's not going to cross over to Wall Street? If you do, I have some swamp land to sell you. Yeah, I know. Uh, in fact, there's five major U.S. banks, including Bank of America, that are in debt to the tune of who knows how many trillions of dollars. So that immediately if Europe goes, and Europe will go even quicker if the Middle East blows up into an unstable disaster, which it appears that with the calling up of the reserves and, the, and getting prepared for war, that that's happening as we speak. Amazing. Back in a moment with more analysis. Carly Schlanger, LaRouchePAC.com, LaRouchePUV.com. Back in just a moment. Welcome back to me. I have lots of topics to, to so discover today. Uh, Harley, let's continue. We've got numerous issues going on here. What's that? Give us more details of what's going on with Europe and uh, the uh, 
also the plans that Helga Zepp LaRouche has for a Mediterranean right. Marshall plan to rebuild Europe. The fact is Europe is falling apart. And it's falling apart a lot faster than people can assume. Oh, I think that we're the advanced Europe is, state of decay. I think that by this summer we're having the summer of discontent. It's going to be a disaster. And if Israel is going to war right now in May, before June, before the September elections that now Netanyahu is calling, we're going to see two hundred dollar barrel oil. We're going to see a collapse of the world economy by the fall. Well, on on Europe, it's in an advanced state of decay. You know, I, I've been over there for a lot of the last six months. And you can see now the Austrian government. I, I was in Austria and had some contacts with some people in uh, influential positions in Austria. And they kept saying, look, we're with the Germans, we're with the Germans. And now that Merkel is saying that if Sarkozy loses, because Sarkozy in France was Merkel's main collaborator, if Hollande comes in, and we can get to that in a moment, but Hollande is a little different than, than Sarkozy, if he comes in and breaks the Merkel Sarkozy alliance, Merkel is prepared to align with Mario Monti of Italy, who's the Goldman Sachs dictator of Italy. Now, the Austrians are saying, forget it. We're not going to go along with that. Now, meanwhile, Monti faces a situation where there's 34.6% unemployment among people looking for jobs in the age of 16 to 25 in Italy. 34.6% unemployment. That's more than one out of three people looking for jobs in Italy who are young. Now, in this context, you also, as we were talking about before the break, the Spanish banking system breaking down, and their real estate bubble is going down another notch. The Spanish banks have not been forced to write off their bad real estate debt yet, just like the U.S. banks. So uh, they're in, in serious trouble. So Mrs. LaRouche held a webcast, and it's uh, uh, up on our website, LaRouchePack.com, Helga Zepp LaRouche. And one of the things she proposed is the idea of a Marshall Plan. Now, some people think the Marshall Plan was just the U.S. giving money to Germany, and Germany used the money to rebuild. That's not it at all. What was smart about the Marshall Plan is that they knew that Germany needed credit and could get no credit because of the devastation of its economy by the end of World War II. So the Marshall Plan gave some money to a special bank in Germany called the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, which means uh, basically the Credit Bank for Productive Investment. And so the U.S. dollars went into this bank, and from the bank, Ludwig Erhard, who was the finance minister, and Konrad Adenauer, who was really the genius of the German economic miracle, used that to generate credit to not just rebuild the cities, but rebuild industry. And they knew that Germany had skilled engineers, skilled technicians, uh, but they had no capital. So they used the U.S. Marshall Plan credit to build for the future, instead of just spending it to pay off old debt or to, to uh, keep things going for the present. And it meant that Germany went through four or five somewhat difficult years but the result was by the mid fifties they had what was called the uh uh Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle. And so this is what Mrs. LaRouche proposed for Southern Europe. Now she proposed it on Saturday. By Monday at the European Central Bank, at their weekly press conference, they were coming out saying there will be no Marshall Plan for Southern Europe. We have to have austerity. That's the only way to solve the problem. Plus, we have a plan called Europe 2020, where we'll eventually start doing some infrastructure investment. So the European situation is extremely tense. Now, I should just add that they need actually $3.7 trillion, but they're saying it's probably double that. They're not going to get it. Geithner is running around to Japan, to China, to Brazil, to others, saying if you put in some of the money to bail out the banks in Europe, then we'll make sure you get a return. And they're, they, of course, they don't trust Geithner because they know what an idiot he is, what a corrupt, uh, immoral human being the U.S. Treasury Secretary is. So there's no way to rescue Europe. So you're essentially... It's like a, a bus that's balancing on a cliff that you know is eventually going over the cliff. You just don't know so when it, the shift so will words, be look, enough. It, exactly. In other words, it's like the ghost protocol with, uh, Tom, with uh, Tom Cruise 
and only this time you don't get rescued and you don't swing back into the building on the wire. And the, right. uh, the bus goes <laughs> over the side of the uh, the Burj yeah. Dubai uh, towers. So, now, you know, in other words, me, it's, it's yeah. a virtual guarantee that this is going to happen. It's just a matter of what month is it. It's not even what year anymore. It's not and like, it well, this could happen in 2013. Have, what matters is what they have in place when it does happen, and that's what the fight is right now. Uh, well, I think what say, they, here's what I think they're, they're going to do. I think this is actually a controlled demolition, just like 9-11. Well, this is a controlled demolition of the world economy. It's, they've decided the various powers that be are fighting each other as to how they're going to do the demolition. But the fact that there's going to be a demolition is already decided. What they well, want to do is it's they want to bring it discounted by, by a, a section of the British finance absolutely is saying there's – if we can't control things and save the system, then we, we've got Plan B. So they already have Plan B. Yeah, but by the way, Plan B is the mark of the beast. Plan B is a total biometric world currency after they, they destroy the credit worthiness of every nation state, uh, destroy middle classes, have starvation and, de and devastation in regional wars, and uh, massive population shifts from areas where people are already starving to death because the nations don't even have reserve currencies. Now, to I'm buy glad even you staples. brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because you and I talk about this quite often, that there is a genocidal intent behind the post-current transatlantic community. That is, the British, the City of London, Wall Street have a plan, which is for massive population reduction. And I know a lot of your listeners hear it and say, well, you know, isn't this a little extreme? Why would anyone support that? Well... We have up on our website now a couple of things that uh, one is a report that just came out last month from the British Royal Society, which is the leading so-called scientists and intellectuals of Great Britain, who uh, most of whom are funded by the City of London. They put out a report called People and the Planet. And this is for the uh, International Planet on Climate Change, which is coming up our international panel on climate change, which is coming up at the Rio summit in uh, uh, July. But what they say is that human population is the biggest problem on the Earth. The planet's resources are finite. Both of those are lies. The richest parts of the world are consuming much too much. Here's their actual quote. Above the level that it can be sustained for everyone in a population of 7 billion, the first step to a solution is to reduce this unsustainable consumption in both developed and developing economies. So you see how they do that little shift there? They say, well, the, the rich countries are consuming too much, but then they say everyone's consuming too much. Yeah, in other words, uh, living is a burden on the planet, and we're about to take care of it. And, and economic wanna, uh, activity and happiness have to be decoupled. Uh, so in other words... They're ready to start the killing field, is what you're saying. Exactly. In other words, global omnicide of the human population is on the agenda soon. And we're back with Carly Schlanger. The two websites are... LaRouchePAC.com, LaRouchePUB.com. The phone number to call if they want to get more information, Harley. Yeah, before. give us a call. It's, it's 800 922 2907. You know, I used to get a lot of calls from your listeners, and that's really tailed off recently. And I was wondering if it's that people have given up, or, you know, people just think, well, you can't really beat them. Well, these guys are vulnerable. On the break, we were talking about it. Their strategic planning is pretty damn stupid. They're just taking for granted that the population is not going to do anything. So if you want to fight this and you want to get a, a road map of how to do it, you can go to our website so you can talk to a real live person, which I still believe in. I still, still think it's important to talk to people rather than just use computers. So call us at 800-922-2907. It's a toll-free call, 800 800- 922-2907. If you want to talk to me, just tell the person who answers the phone, and I'll, I'll try and get back to you. Now, we were talking about this Royal Academy of Science report, and I think this is really important because you and I have been discussing this, and there are small numbers of other people who actually know about this. 
a lot of people suspect there's something wrong, but they, they get scared off when someone says, well, that's a conspiracy theory. It's no conspiracy theory. These guys are actually openly saying they want to reduce the world's population by five to six times, from, from seven billion to one and a half to two billion. Now, or Paul less. Ehrlich... Or- you know Paul Ehrlich, the name Paul Ehrlich. He yes. wrote the population bomb in the 60s. And he's the one who predicted by the 90s we'd have famine and, and chaos and loss of population. So he's completely wrong. However, now he's saying we cannot sustain more than one and a half billion people. And he said it's going to be very difficult to figure out how to reduce the population, but we must do it. Now, Ehrlich is important because he's not just some kook who's out there. He is a kook, but he is the mentor and the co-author of several books with a man named Sir John Holdren, who is President Obama's... Yeah, Sir John Holdren, Obama's advisor on science policy. And, And they wrote a book where they talked about the necessity of eliminating the elderly, the poor, the sick, no longer taking care of people who are going to be a drain on society. And now Ehrlich is coming out openly saying 1.5 billion, that's the peak population. So here's the guy who Obama turns to for science advice, who's a genocidal maniac, which is, of course, why Obama put him in there, because Obama's a genocidal maniac. Right. But this is not stuff we're making up. This is in, go Google the Royal Academy of Science on their April 2012 release of a, a report called People and the Planet. Read it for yourself. Look up uh, Paul Ehrlich and his recent statements. It's E H uh, R L I C H, I think it is. Or, yeah, E H R L I C H. Look into this. If you don't get angry about it, you're not really a human being. Right, you've lost your ability to be human. Yeah, because so much of our population has become passive that a bunch of bloodthirsty, thuggish, moral imbeciles like Lord Victor Rothschild, like uh, Holdren, like Maurice Strong, people who are the gurus of the environmentalist movement, who don't want clean air, they want fewer people. This is what, when the Rockefeller family set up the Population Council in the 50s, this is what their goal was. Margaret Sanger, who set up the uh, uh, Planned Parenthood, you know, the Planned Parenthood's original intent was to weed out the inferior species. So we're dealing with something that makes Hitler look like a moderate. And that's why LaRouche is saying that Obama has to go. And if you understand this, or if you want to find out more about it because it's frightening you, give us a call. Go to our website. Again, it's 800-922-2907. And when you listen to Dr. Deagle, you should realize that he's not some guy who who banged his head too often falling off a motorcycle or something. Well, you can can go back to the actual documents. You can see the 1974 document with uh, uh, none other than, uh, uh, you know, our... Kissinger. Kissinger. We can look at yeah. the uh, Global 2000 documents. We look at the uh, right. 1992 Rio conference. We can look at the Earth and Balance uh, documents uh, written by Igor Al Gore, his book. We can look at the uh, Green Earth Charter by Mikhail Gorbachev, who's now they're having a, a, a Nobel yeah. Prize uh, conference now of all these Nobel Prize people. I was watching it on TV while I was working out this morning uh, in, in, at the well, Sierra Wellness Center. Uh, people don't understand when we say things. <clears throat> And when people want to attack the messenger, I just want to slap you. I, I don't want to hear any more of this stuff. I just want to slap you. And I, well, slap it a love. It's not a hard slap where I'd hurt you, but a love tap to say. Metaphor. How about a, a metaphorical, metaphorical, slap. metaphorical slap? A metaphorical slap to say, please don't say that. I'm not doing this for my own sake. I'm trying to do it so the society, I've got a grandchild, I've got kids. I want there to be a future. You and I, Harley, we're going to be around here, you know, how many, who knows how many years. With life extension, we might be a long time, or it might be a very short time, especially with the kind of list with the National Defense Authorization Act well, with and the all the renditions policy, and everything else. Yeah, with the drone policy of Obama, you're never sure how long you're going to be around. But I'll tell well, you what, yeah. <clears throat> as long as I'm around, I am going to be the biggest thorn in the side of the globalists. 
because I am not going to tolerate it. And yeah. as you know, I now have a, a little baby, and it's made me more aware. It's not that, I mean, I've always been committed to the idea of the future and, and the children of the world. But I think having a, a child has made me realize how precious life is and how precious well, we, every child and we, is. And we can, we can stop it, actually. Most of our military police won't do anything to the citizenry. But, you know, honestly, I'm at the point where I think maybe I should order, order some extra body bags and put a sign out front. So if they ever decide to come for me, I'll say, yes, I, one of these body bags is for me, but there's also some for you. Well, I think we have to make sure that we win this fight for civilization. We have to. We and don't have any choice. This is the uh, because 2012 we have... is like is like the, the final fulcrum point because they're actually pulling the plug in the world economy. They want to start a war when there's not even a, a rational reason to do a war. Like, why is Israel going to worry now? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Well, let me let me tell you something that's interesting. I wrote a, a, a report the other day called, What If They Gave a Convention and No One Came? And it's about the, Demo the state of the Democratic Party. I have reports now from California, Missouri, Wyoming, Texas, New Jersey, Connecticut, and about four other states where the Democratic Party is scrambling to find people who will be delegates for Obama to the Democratic National Convention. They had an event for, just as an example, in your neck of the woods in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles County, uh, Hispanic, Hispanics for Obama. They had a lavish spread at a fancy Mexican restaurant. They had a member of the Democratic National Committee, a member of Obama's campaign team, and they said, come and have dinner on us and talk about the 2012 election. They had hoped for 100 to 200 people. They had 20 people who showed up, 10 of whom were the ones putting on the event. And the 10 who came, uh, most of them came for the free meal. And when they said, would uh -huh. you like to be a delegate for Obama? And someone said, well, let me ask you something. What has he done for us? And they couldn't answer. They said, well, he's better than Romney. And oh, the person no. said, well, all <clears throat> I know is he's been in for three years and my life has gotten worse. Well, let's put it this in way. If you had a president in a coma, he could do better than, than uh, Obama. In Texas, where in 2008, they had thousands of people showing up at the Senate District Caucuses. There were two in Houston where they had five people in each caucus. They had 27 and 32 slots for the state convention. They couldn't even fill state, state convention slots. And then of the five people at one of them, they said, would anyone here like to be a delegate to the national convention? And one of them said, I ain't paying money to go and, and stand there for Obama. <laughs> so, and of course, the, the party can't pay people to do it. So this is the malaise and the hostility that's been brought on by this president. Yeah, yeah. And also he's done everything. And, and as well, the party has committed to Japanese harikari by crushing the idea of even getting alternatives to Obama at the convention. It's just a mess. Unbelievable. The party is committing suicide. Bye-bye, Democrats. Welcome back. Lots of uh, other issues. The um, I do believe there's hope, though. I don't. I'm not uh, a negative person, but I'm a realistic person. I think that's what I like about the LaRouche Foundation, is they face the stark reality, and then they say, "Look, but we have this plan. The plan is step A, B, C, D. <clears throat> if you do it, you're going to be fine. <clears throat> if you don't as do you it, know, as you know, as a physician, if you don't take the harshest view possible of what you face, you're not going to deal with it." But well, once you know what you're facing, then you approach it. You roll up your sleeves and you say, let's get at this thing. Well, I think that's and what the Rush has done is he's inspired the young people, the people like yourself that are experts, and to have a foundation of many minds that are positive thinkers, out-of-the-box people, people like yourself. Keisha Rogers is going to be running in the 22nd District in Houston. She'll be on next week. People like Cody Jones that talks about the galactic and other cycles that says, look, yeah, we're going to go through channel challenges that may be extinction-level events, but we're mankind. If we don't advance and we start planning for it, just like we can literally engineer the Earth to make it a better place to live by bringing water down from the northwest, from Canada and Alaska, to the southwest United States, that we don't need to, to 
to think it's the end of the world, or do the craziness idea, which the globalists want, is to reduce the population, thinking, right. well, all we have to do is just kill 95% of people, and like the Malthusians, we can reproduce again. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's Bertrand Russell's argument, that he said that if we do get wars and plagues to reduce the population, those that survive may procreate freely. Yeah, so, for a while, for a while. Until, yeah, the, right. until, until the next until bunch of king rats is... That's yeah. right. The next bunch well, of king rats decides to kill us all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things on this question of optimism is that, you know, I've worked with LaRouche now, this is going into my 40th year, and LaRouche is... 40th, you mean 40, 4th or 4 zero? Four zero. Whoa. I started working with LaRouche in uh, 1972. And uh-huh. one thing that he's always said is that the world and the universe is always going to be changing. And you have, if you can't change the way you think and constantly improve the way you think, you're going to have a hard time staying, keeping pace with the galaxy. Now, you mentioned Cody. I, I had a, an event once in Los Angeles. We had about 150 people at a town meeting. And Cody opened it by saying, look, I'm here to bring you a dire warning. Sometime in the next five billion years, our sun is going to go nova on us and wipe out the life potential on the earth. And and he paused for a second and he said, so we have five billion years to work on this, but what are we doing now? We're going backwards. (laughs) (laughs) And so he said, so we'd better roll up our sleeves and get to work on it. And that's exactly the point. The human race has an almost infinite capability, potential. That's why it says in the Bible that uh, now that they are in one place and of one language, which with the Internet and global communications we are, uh, that nothing will be restrained from us. That's actually not the word of man. That's the word of God. God said that. In other words, we are literally co-creators of our future. We have to also be stewards of the earth, not destroyers. Destroying the oceans by having our shipping lanes and cutting across the great whales. But poisoning the oceans with the... Pre- not doing anything about... Now they're finally going to have a United Nations call a year plus later to do something about Fukushima. And the latest disaster is they're now seeing that that reactor number four cooling pool and reactor three mox pool, this, where they're doing the illegal plutonium detonation program to have nuclear weapons, that these will cause hydrothermal explosions and also, people have to understand there's been neutron tra- uh, beams coming out of the place for the last year. Those neutrons create heavy water that's a what's called a neutron uh, slower. It slows down neutrons and increases chain reactions. The combination of that agglomerating corium and increased neutron activity means it's going to have not only hydrogen explosions, but we're going to have a nuclear explosion. It doesn't have to be a big one. It can be one or two kilotons, ten kilotons. Uh, the one, by the way, in Nagasaki was 15 kilotons. Let's say it's two kilotons. That's enough to spread that debris over northern Japan and put a radiation cloud over the whole hemisphere. Well, and we can, there are ways to deal with these <clears throat> things. I mean, the basic point in the book of Genesis is that man has dominion over nature. Exactly. Because we're in the image and likeness of God. And that means, in the same way that there was a creator of the universe that created it with some laws and principles that that we have to discover still. We haven't discovered probably well, uh, one one-hundredth of what's well, out Let there. me give you another, another principle. I've actually was, uh, been praying on this for some time, and I got, I believe, a supernatural revelation as to what to do with the radioisotopes. And we have the capability of generating what's called scalar radiation. You can create a radiation in what's called ion cyclotron resonance. And if you have the resonance frequency of, say, a specific ion, like calcium, magnesium, sodium, in fact, we're going to be launching here the Metathera, which is designed in Germany, which is a pulse magnetic field that's the only one that actually has what's called ion resonance frequencies in it. So you can actually set it up to the sodium potassium pump. If you set it up to the non radioactive ion resonance of an element that's in the same periodic table as a radioactive element, it shatters off the radioactive element and it increases the rate of decay of that element. In other words, it can actually speed up the decay so that it can become non radioactive. So I really believe, like Nikola Tesla that said way, 80 years you're ago. Describing, what you're describing is how we use the processes in nature to our benefit. Right. In other and words, we, this, we can take an isotope that might take 200 years to be gone, and you actually can set up a satellite over that area blasting a scalar radiation to take uh, and just send a signal down for the normal non-radioactive isotope so it doesn't affect nature adversely. But if there's a radioactive isotope, it'll increase its decay. So instead of its T1 half being, let's say, say, uh, 40 years or 60 years, it might be 
20 days. Well, and this is also the, if you think about what we are seeing from the Crab Nebula with the gamma ray explosions or the solar coronal uh, emissions, we're seeing things now better because of our satellites and, and telescopes. But we're, we still don't even have hypotheses for these things. And, and we should be the, the, the most curious people well, one of the one of the age. well, what, what, what's happening though? And here's the interesting thing about curiosity. Wait, the, you're familiar with the uh, uh, Rhodes Scholarship Program. Now, what's mm-hmm. happening is our global our globalists are all Satanists. People have to understand it. Doesn't matter what label you call it, whether they're high level Mormons, Buddha, you know, Tibetan Buddhists, uh, people that call themselves communists. They're basically at the top Satanists, and Satanists basically is a form of secular humanism, where literally, quote, man is God and replaces God. And basically, we don't need to actually even have any true humanity. Well, back to Nietzsche saying God is dead. Right, exactly. So, so, so true Which Satanism is really basically... Aristotle's idea. Yeah, true Satanism is basically man is God and becomes a demigod through science. In other words, super science alone without the creator God, we can literally master the universe, which is a lie. The fact is, though... That man is a steward of Earth, and we're on the edge of extending human lifespan. I'm doing research with Dr. Pierre Pauli on uh, TRH, which is the Benjamin Button molecule. Uh, I actually started on it a month ago, and I can actually feel age reversal already happening. Uh, they did experiments and found that on the animals that they gave TRH, it showed actual reversal of aging. And the reason why the globalists are in a panic, because they don't want to see people like uh, Linda LaRouche around at 180. They don't want to see. They don't want to see Harley Schlanger playing with his great, 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 great grandchildren and developing dynastic wealth and going to university ten times and traveling the earth and maybe having a, a, a summer home on Mars or other things. They don't want that. They don't want brilliant people that are humanitarians that don't necessarily have to quote work. They literally contribute to the future of civilization, just so, like an know, eternal after, species. After Michael Kirsch was on your program, he said he's decided we've got to start working on a Nawapa project for Mars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the fact is, even things like terraforming the planets, uh, one of the big things that I think is particularly nasty under Obama is the destruction of the NASA space program. And I know it went black out, but I remember having a dialogue uh, four years ago with one of my contacts who happened to be a Canadian who is a senior engineer on the Aurora Space Fleet. Now, people may not know about Gary McKinnon. He's the Ashburgers uh, Scotsman, who actually was a young fellow, uh, probably about 20 years ago, hacked into the uh, naval intelligence and actually tracked uh, fleets of off-world spacecraft. Now, the fact is, I have talked to the engineers. I had Q-level clearance with Space Command, so I know that our real space program is hundreds of years ahead of what people think. The Tinker Toy, we call the space shuttle are now going to park in the Smithsonian Museum. It was designed in the 1930s. You can actually go to, you know, the archives and see it was actually designed by German astronaut scientists. And what we have now is so much more advanced. What we need to do is actually make public and utilize this technology, not only for America, but for all the nations of the Earth, to not only prepare us for Earth changes and galactic changes, but also for all the species and move to a, from a zero-order economy to a level one economy where you don't have to, quote, work or say, make or, quote, produce goods in order to survive. You've got limitless energy, limitless information, life extension. We need to work on a order level one economy because we're at zero. And the globalists want to get rid of most of us because their solution to the problem is let's turn it all into a park by killing everyone and we'll start back at the square one again with 200 or 500 million people. Amazingly evil. Thank you, Harley. Again, the number is 800. Very good. 800-800-8255. 